Welcome to a very special THI podcast here on TarHeelIllustrated.com. And if you're checking us out on our YouTube channel, Tar Heel Illustrated, I'm THI publisher Andrew Jones, and I'm really excited about doing this podcast. I've been looking forward to it for a while. If you happen to have been on our site last week, you saw we ran a really cool three-part series about the greatest UNC football player of all time, Charlie Choo Choo Justice. And I'm so excited to have the author of those three stories and also the author of the book, Football, Navy, War, which is kind of where this whole thing originated from. It's about Choo Choo Justice before he was a Tar Heel. He was a superstar before he was a Tar Heel. And I'd like to bring on our very special guest who wrote those stories in that book, the author of 19 books, the 19th being his memoir coming out here in the next couple of months, my father, Wilbur Jones. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks. Andrew, thanks very much, and it's a, it's a privilege to be on TarHeelIllustrated.com uh, to talk about Choo Choo Justice, and um, and I got to tell you that uh, uh, I do remember that uh, guy, uh, Justice, at Carolina, but during the war, uh, I was interested in, the, in World War II history and playing World War II games, and that um, uh, listening to Charlie Justice, I never had a chance to to, to see him play in person, but I certainly heard a lot of broadcasts when he was playing um, for the Tar Heels. Well, you're a military historian. You, you're, your career is extensive. You've done a lot of stuff in politics. You're a retired U.S. Navy captain, and you've written now your 19th book, which is your memoir, which uh, comes out in a couple of months. A lot of the books you wrote for the Department of Defense, but a lot have also been commercial. This is the only sports book. The rest of them are either uh, Department of Defense based or their military history and a lot of stuff focused on World War II, which is sort of your your baby. Why did you decide to do this book about not just Choo Choo Justice and the Bainbridge Naval Training Station team that that was a sensational club during World War II, during 1943 and 44 in particular, and just college football, how, how awkward and curious it was at that time because there were so many teams playing college football that had players from other great teams, some pro teams, and, and they weren't actually college teams. What kind of inspired you to do that book? Well, the inspiration, um, strangely enough, uh, came from the, the, the death of Charlie Choo Choo Justice in 2003. Uh, the local newspaper, our regional paper, the Wilmington Star News, uh, gave me uh, the privilege of writing the uh, football obituary for the paper. And I got right on it and I uh, ended up talking uh, twice uh, to uh, uh, J the justice widow, Sarah, um, in uh, Cherryville, and was able to uh, find three of his uh, teammates who played uh, for him on uh, the Carolina team. And as I got into it, uh, the name Bainbridge kept popping up, uh, the Bainbridge Navy, Navy Training Center in, in Maryland, uh, north of uh, Baltimore. And I thought, man, oh man, there's there's a story. There are two stories here. There's uh, there's Charlie Justice, but I'm not writing about him at Carolina. Um, let's write about what he did during the war because that's where he got his start. He was an absolute phenom, uh, as it, as they were called, a phenomenon. That the uh, uh, the abbreviation for that, and and he was the probably the number one prodigy, the most famous football player that came out of what became the golden age of football uh, during World War II. Some of the most famous names, the players, the coaches, the teams, uh, and it was all brought together uh, because of the fact that we were at war. So I was able to not only use my interest in Carolina, uh, being a Carolina graduate, and my interest in Charlie Justice, having uh, heard uh, very much about him uh, while uh, he was playing at Carolina. But because my primary field of studies was World War II, I knew that there had to be a story there that had never been told. And the story, it, a lot of people in this state or Carolina fans know a little bit about Asheville Charlie, and they know about Carolina Charlie and a little bit about the, his short career in the NFL with the Redskins afterward. Very few people know about this. During my travels, and I've been in this state covering the ACC for more than two decades, 24 years, and, and I've talked, periodically I've talked to a lot of different other members of the media about this, and I think one, 
Brett Friedlander may have known about it. I don't think anybody else knew about his exploits playing for the Bainbridge team up in uh, Maryland. Bainbridge is located just north of Baltimore up in Maryland and how good he was. I mean, he was an absolute superstar. And what's amazing is he was a superstar as the youngest guy on the team playing among other college stars and even some, some professionals. Tell people about what that how, how interesting the fact is that the youngest guy on the team was one of the best players, and yet nobody had heard of him before he got there. Well, he was 18 years old and just graduated from high school um, in in Asheville, and had just gotten married to Sarah, by the way. Their their marriage lasted um, over 50 years. But when he got to, to Bainbridge, um, uh, his job, uh, he was drafted into the Navy, and his job was uh, to train uh, recruits called boots, in physical exercise and get and push them and and get them physically ready for whatever their next assignment would be. So he was uh, he was an enlisted man and eventually made second class petty officer. But it was also uh, convenient that he found a little time to play some uh, very serious football. And during the war, many of the the, the military bases, the Air Force, the Army. Uh, Navy and Marine Corps and, and Coast Guard, particularly the um, the Army and the Navy, uh, they had teams on the bases. And they also played not only themselves, but they played colleges, universities. And it was not unusual at all uh, to see a military team from the Army uh, play uh, one of the major colleges from the Big Ten, for example. Now, um, to make a what, what is a, an in-depth story uh, short enough uh, for your for your viewers is many of the players on the college teams were actually candidates uh, for naval officer commissions, and they were sent there by the Navy before they went to midshipmen's or officers candidate school, and the Army didn't do that. The Navy did. And many of these these players that were that were drafted um, and and then played on college teams were from the NFL. They were all Americas in college, or they had uh, sensational careers before they uh, were assigned uh, to uh, to the colleges. So we had colleges playing colleges, the colleges playing the military, and the military playing each other. Now, the Bainbridge team was sensational for the two years that Charlie Justice played there in 1943-44. Uh, they won 17 games in a row and were hardly scored on. Now, he was such a sensation, but he never started. Uh, he was just a kid. He had to earn his way on the team. But once it, they, he got the ball, he was gone. And part of the fun I had in putting together those columns uh, for Tar Heel Illustrated was to point out how the sports writers in the newspapers and and uh, uh, the, the the military uh, uh, station papers and and others and the football annuals and the NCAA and everything else the yearbooks how they covered him some of the the uh, hyperbole they used uh, the jargon of the times. Uh, uh, words that you would not use anymore covering today's Tar Heels, but it was so flowery, and it was it was the kind of stuff that I grew up with. But um, almost every kind of description having to do with his speed, uh, the fact that he was very shifty as a runner, um, he danced, he bobbed, he weaved, uh, he was like lightning, um, uh, shot out of a cannon. All of those those today might even be trite even be passe but not on, not only did i have fun in doing all of that and taking a look at how he was covered considering he only averaged playing about 10 minutes a game in two years because he had all these heavyweights playing with him all these all americans and the other thing i wanted to touch on was the fact that that i tried to cover how he developed as a man he came in as 18 year old playing with a bunch of uh, 20 year olds, 25 year olds, and how he developed as a man, which made him very mature when he got out of the Navy at the end of the war and went to Carolina. He only played 10 minutes a game, but they routed most of the people they played, so he didn't have to play a lot. But one of the 
I think it was the, the third uh, part to your series, you noted one game, I think it was, was, it may have been the game he played in Keenan Stadium, the only time he played in Keenan Stadium as a visiting player, where he had several huge touchdown runs, and I think he only touched them all eight or nine times and had close to 200 yards. Every run was a big run. But, but going back to the description stuff, that's where Choo Choo was born. A lot of Carolina fans, I think, believe that the Choo Choo nickname occurred when he was in Chapel Hill, but it actually he got that nickname before he got to Chapel Hill. Can you share, people, uh, share with people that story. Well, yes, and that, uh, of course, Choo Choo is one of the most famous uh, nicknames given to any athlete in, in American sports history. And he got that in 1943 uh, by playing uh, games of, at, at, with Bainbridge, and, and naval officers saw him play, and uh, the sources were that a couple of them said, look at this kid carry the ball. He's running like a freight train. And another one said, "He's he can carry the ball like a choo-choo. Let's call him choo-choo. So he became choo-choo justice, and, man, the rest is history. And, and those teams and what they were able to do, why did the Navy – they, there were a lot of teams. You, I can't remember the number that you have in your book, how many teams there actually were. But there, you know, March Field had great teams. North Carolina pre-flight had a big-time team for a couple of years. Why did were those teams formed? And why? Uh, how important was it to the college football landscape and the sports landscape and maybe just morale in the country that we had those teams? And the fact that there were so many – notable players playing together that a year before were on different teams and some were even rivals. Well, the, the most important thing uh, for the armed forces in, in, in playing football was to get them ready to go to war, get them ready for combat physically. And the, the Navy uh, certainly was, a, was the biggest beneficiary because if they, they put all their officers through this training at, in, at colleges and at the Naval stations where they were playing, and many of them turned out to be Marines, Marine officers. They served on, on uh, Iwo Jima and Okinawa. Uh, a number of them were killed with casualties, believe it or not, including some, some All-Americas. But not only were they, was the intent to get them ready for combat, but by playing football, uh, and the president, President Roosevelt, wanted to see that, this is, that it was carried out. Playing football was great for the morale on the home front. I mean, we were a country at war. It's very difficult um, for those who did not grow up or did not experience World War II, but the whole country was, was just uh, caught up and encapsulated by the war. And this was great uh, for the morale for the home front. And they sold a lot of war bonds that way too. So, Bainbridge in 1944. Now, now, Bainbridge in 1943, their final their final AP ranking was 17. In 1944, their final AP ranking was number five. But the game that they played in, in Chapel Hill, Keaton Stadium, it was early November 1944. It was nearly a full house. I believe capacity at Keaton was 24,000 at the time. There were 22,000 attendants, and the Tar Heels were not playing. It was North Carolina pre-flight versus Bainbridge NTS, and Choo Choo played in that game. That was one of the biggest games of the year in college football that year. And Bainbridge went in there and spanked them. When, in your research, you know, going back to that game, what do you recall kind of what you learned from that game and the importance of that game for Chuchu, especially the irony was a couple of years later, he was doing that stuff for the Tar Heels on that field. Yeah, well, we didn't know that. We couldn't predict that he was yeah. going to play at Carolina because for those of us who read the columns that I wrote, we know that he was, that for a long time, he was headed for another school, which wasn't very far away. But during that game in 1944, and consider that North Carolina pre flying at that time uh, had, had beaten uh, uh, Duke. Uh, they beat Navy, which were two powerhouses. Uh, they were ranked number one. Uh, of all the military teams, the pre-flight, and these are Navy um, aviation candidates. After they finish the pre-flight, then they go down to Florida for their flight training. But their, but their star was a quarterback named Otto Graham, who was an All-America at Northwestern. And uh, of course, uh, the Bainbridge was, was a great team too. And these clash of, of Titans there in Keenan Stadium. But it was the first time that Justice ever played in Keenan Stadium. And um, I did pretty good, you know, a couple hundred yards, scored a couple hundred, a couple of touchdowns or so. And so after the game, 
his teammates picked up this little kid. Remember, he was only five foot ten, about 170 pounds, playing with all these behemoths, these giants. They picked him up, carried him off the field on his shoulders, and the whole crowd cheered. He was a hometown boy. I mean, he was a home state boy. And um, never mind that they beat the pre-flight because it was they hadn't beaten the Tar Heels, but uh, he was a hero that day. And uh, boy, did he come back the next time uh, in 1946. And 46 through 49 at Carolina, he was the, the only two-time runner-up for the Heisman Trophy until Darren McFadden in 07 and 08. McFadden had played at Arkansas. They, most people paint that, uh, watching this or listening to this, they, they have a lot of familiarity with Justice's UNC career. What a lot of them may not know is how Justice got to UNC. Some might say, okay, he picked Carolina over Duke, but there's more to the story. Fill everybody in on that. Well, uh, of course, for a long time, he was headed to Duke. Uh, Duke's coach, Eddie Cameron, uh, you know, Cameron Indoor Stadium, um, he was was certain that that Charlie was going to go to Duke. He had he had turned down, and when he well he didn't turn down when the Navy uh, drafted him. Uh, he had had just a ton of of college scholarship offers, and um, it was sort of assumed that uh, he was going to go play to Duke for Duke after the war. But um, but as it turned out, he went another way, uh, just to head down the road to Chapel Hill. But how he got there was uh, Carolina offered him the scholarship. And he said, uh, I'll make a deal with you. Uh, one condition, I'll come to Carolina. And the athletic director said, what is that? He said, I'm eligible for the GI Bill. <laughs> I'm military. I'll go on the GI Bill if you give my athletic football scholarship to my wife, Sarah. <laughs> and Carolina accepted. So Charlie went, to, he played at Carolina, not on a football scholarship, but on the GI Bill, you know, like any other fellow who's coming out of the military. And Sarah went on a football scholarship for two years, and, and, she, and then she dropped out in order to start raising their first child. But I don't know, uh, maybe Bubba Cunningham can look this up, but uh, she may be the only female that we've ever had at Carolina on a football scholarship. Times were different back then. Rules were different, times were different. And to me, of all the things that you uncovered during your research, that was probably one of the neatest nuggets because, because that's a story that it doesn't matter what area you're interested in. Because some people don't really – find World War II college football very interesting. But that nugget right there is interesting, especially uh, with things have changed so much in the last 70 years. When you look back at your research with the Bay Bridge team, just the, the college football during those two years, and justice in general, what is your favorite story that we haven't addressed so far in this podcast? Well, I, I have two favorite stories. Uh, one is the greatest game that was played uh, during the war. Um, was between um, uh, Notre Dame and Great Lakes Navy Training Center. Here we have Notre Dame was number one in the country and Great Lakes Naval Training Station, uh, I was, some people would say that was the number one team in the in military team, but I, I'm, I favor Bainbridge. But Great Lakes won on the last, in the last few seconds of the game, when Steve Latch, who was a star quarterback at Duke, threw a long touchdown pass and beat Notre Dame 19 to 14. But you know what? When the AP came out with their rankings the next week, <laughs> Notre Dame was still number one in the AP. <laughs> Great Lakes had moved up a little bit. And then I have another good story, another quick story. Um, in 1944, uh, Bainbridge uh, played uh, at Camp Lejeune Marines twice. And the star for Camp Lejeune was a kid named Elroy Crazy Legs Hirsch, a running back. Now, Hirsch was a phenomenon who, who played that year, believe it or not, the way these military players moved around where their, the Marine Corps, the Navy would assign them this place and that. All in the same season, he played. He started out at Wisconsin. Um, then he moved, played for Michigan. And then he ended up playing for, um, for Camp Lejeune. So he was the star, the greatest classic matchup 
of the entire war years was Crazy Legs Hirsch versus Choo Choo Justice. And Bainbridge beat the, you know, beat the tar out of, out of, out of Lejeune. And Charlie Justice loved to talk about the fact that he faked out on an 83 yard uh, sweep around the end, faked out Hirsch. And um, that was, that was the classic. I did some of the research for you for this book. When you and I went down to Lejeune one day and did some stuff. I think I went down another time and was combing through all the, the military-based newspapers from back then. And that game, I remember the play that you're talking about because it was a description of it where I, I can't specifically remember it, but I think the writer said, he ran for an 80-yard touchdown but ran about 150 yards to get there <laughs> and, and must have run past every opposing defender at least once. <laughs> That's right. But the, main one, but the main one he ran past was Hirsch. And uh, can I say one more thing for the yeah. for football theorists? Um, uh, these anecdotes are, are fine, and they're all part of the story in my book. But for those who are, are students of the game, uh, coaches and otherwise, would be interested to know that, that during the war years, uh, football transitioned out of um, the old three yards in a cloud of dust stuff uh, with a lot of refinements that evolved into what we now know of as the game. For example, the, the forward pass became much more popular. Unbalanced lines on offense, um, uh, multiple backs in the backfield, uh, a back in motion, um, uh, the T formation. And still, the single wing, which Charlie Justice played at Carolina, the single wing where the tailback is is the runner, the passer, in some cases the punter, um, it, it evolved into what is now uh, the shotgun formation. And also that during the war years, the, the um, substitution of defensive players or offensive players uh, uh, with getting away from from those who played both sides of the ball, those who were specialists in either offense or defense. Now, before we close this thing out, I did want to let people know that you went to Carolina, as full disclosure, and you actually lettered in two sports there, soccer, lacrosse. You were president of the Monogram Club. I don't think anyone would ever mistake you for a choo-choo justice of your sports or anything like that. But what is your one favorite memory of being a Letterman athlete at Carolina? Uh, well, we, we didn't have much of a budget, <laughs> but uh, we, we played, we played uh, our lacrosse on uh, Navy Field, uh, which uh, it doesn't look like it does anymore because the Navy had come to Chapel Hill and completely took over you know, the, the, everything on campus. And, and we played our soccer games on Fetzer Field, which I think it's been renamed now. It's been remodeled. Um, when I go back there, it's hard to reminisce because of all of the AstroTurf and uh, the modern facilities there and, and the new um, uh, playing stadiums and such. But um, those, those, were, those were, were the days when our crowds are, were not very large. Uh, we all drank water out of the same water bucket. <laughs> and a guy named Sarge Keller in Woolen Gym uh, gave us our uh, our fresh uh, jocks and socks uh, before every practice. <laughs> yeah, that's not too different from when I played in high school. We used to, we had a giant, uh, like a chili spoon, a chili scoop thing. We used to just dip it into a bucket and drink and hand it to the next guy. I don't think they allow that now. I can't remember any of us gets gotten sick, but no. our, our team, our teams, our lacrosse team was was not nearly as good as as the heels have been over the last twenty years. Our soccer team was pretty good; we were able to handle ourselves. But but our lacrosse team had a lot of work. I never I never knew, the first lacrosse game I ever saw, I played in <laughs> as <a> midfielder. <laughs> I figured, why not? <laughs> anyway, I had a lot of fun. <laughs> uh, we're going to hit on Carolina football and basketball, the current team here, and just to close this out here in just a second. Before we do, if you're interested in checking out just my dad's very interesting life, go to Wilbur, uh, WilburJones.com, and you can see lots of really neat stuff. You have lived a very interesting life. That would be a podcast for a different time in a different platform, but uh, I think people would be very fascinated by your many experiences in politics and and 
even you even umpired the senior league world series which i have always thought was one of the coolest accomplishments of your um, vast career the current tar heels let's start football real quickly and then we'll hit on roy williams basketball team you're you're a big carolina fan and and i think one of the one of the things that's kind of helped me as a sports writer is being related to somebody who's such a passionate college sports fan so when i used to cover the whole league i, I kind of knew how to I relate to NC State fans or Duke fans or Carolina fans, kind of give them what they want because they know what you've always wanted as a fan. So as a passionate Carolina fan, what are your thoughts on Mac Brown's program going into year two, not just the recruiting, but all the guys they got coming back and what their potential is for this coming season? And I do believe there will be a season. Yes, I, I, um, I, we all hope that they're entrusted. There will be. Um, Mac Brown was a, was a super hire for Carolina. Um, he's a fantastic coach and all of that. But um, we have to be careful because uh, the team has a lot of key uh, skill players coming back um, and the coaches are phenomenal. Um, we have to be careful about having too much expectations. Um, I happen to be sort of cautious, and I don't predict that Roy Williams is going to win the ACC or national championship every year. Um, we, we know they're going to be better, but they, they start off with a tough schedule. And uh, uh, Central Florida and Auburn, uh, they're not pushovers. And I don't want folks to get disappointed. Let's, let's trust that they will be better and uh, they will win more games, and they'll be just as exciting, and um, go from there. Roy, he's coming off 14 and 19. He, he, we haven't been able to talk to him for, I don't know, a month and a half, I guess, seven weeks. Um, I imagine we'll get him fairly soon. We usually do every June. He recently did an interview on a national radio show where he said that his, his burning desire is greater than ever. Roy is definitely a guy in the past, like after 2010 when they lost 17 games, you know, that bad taste just, just fuels him so much. He's going to be 70 this coming season and says that, his, that he's got the burn as much as any time in his career. And it's always very consistently at an amazingly high level. What are your thoughts about Roy, seven years old, bringing in all these young kids with a few guys left over, just to kind of where he is at this point in his career and where the program is? Well, I envy Roy for being seven because I'm way, 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 way ahead of him on that. So he's got a lot of way. He's got a lot of rubber left on the tire. I tell you that. But here's here's what here's the way I think about it, um, and I, I'm showing my wisdom now. Uh, that 14 and 19 season was probably one of the best things that could happen to Roy Williams. He wasn't used to that. Uh, he he got a kick in the rear end, and uh, and and it wasn't not. It, it, you, it can't put the, the fault on him with all the injuries and the, and the last second shots that went in for them and not us, but it was good for him because it, it maybe it brought him down to earth. And um, when you do that, you have a, you know, you, um, you bring yourself, uh, um, you bring yourself up a little bit and, and uh, reorganize and boy, the class he's got coming in and the kids he's got coming back. Uh oh, there I'm talking expectations again. I have to be careful, but I I would almost guarantee you <laughs> that um, that the team will be much better, much more improved, and win more games than last year. Uh, having covered Roy very closely since he came back, I can assure you he learned a ton in 2010. He learned a ton while the NCAA cloud hung over, and I think he became a much better coach during that time. And he's going to learn a ton from 14 and 19. I think he's going to be a better coach. And the program is in unbelievable shape. Uh, I think 2021, they're going to get a couple of big time players and they're going to, they're, they're going to be back in that cycle that they were in before the NCAA cloud. Now I'm going to put you on a little bit of a spot here. You don't have to take it if you don't want to, but with the club they have coming back and what six freshmen, Anthony Harris will be a seventh scholarship freshman because he's going to be a redshirt freshman. Which of those kids, so the freshmen, do you just kind of have a gut feeling is going to be the guy that kind of steps forward and is the one most people talk about most often? Well, Caleb Love, I mean, he's he's inheriting the ball handler, but uh, we've had two straight one-and-done um, point guards who really weren't point guards. 
and they were shooters and scorers. And and if if Caleb Love is listening, uh, I trust that you, young man, will will be the team leader um, at the one position that those other two uh, young men were were not capable of doing. And um, as good as they were, I think Caleb Love is is the key. But I'm really looking forward to this R.J. Davis and um, and and uh, and Dayron Sharp. Uh, and busting some boards down there with with Brooks and and um, and Kessler, uh, boy, are we going to have some trees down there? <laughs> yeah, I think they're going to be very very good. It's going to be fun chronicling them from what they looked like in early November to whatever the finished product in late March, maybe early April will be. Well, we're almost done here. Um, this is we know we we knew we've been we were going to do this podcast for a few weeks. For me, it's very special having you on. The reason I am still in this business and I've survived as long as I have is, is my wife and you. You're the two most important people that have kind of helped me out. You have read a lot of my stuff and given me a lot of advice over time and encouragement, especially early on in my career. So I thank you for that. And if people read your work and they read this, Navy, uh, this football and Navy war book and some of the other stuff, they'll know who the best writer in the family is. And it's not me. <laughs> But they'll know that I'm striving. I'm climbing up that hill daily to kind of to kind of meet that standard. And, and you provided a standard for me to shoot for every day in my life. And I thank you for that. Andrew, you have succeeded. And and this is the first time in my writing career that you have been my editor, yes. my three columns. And so uh, you have taught me well. You have taught me well. Thank you. Well, so people watching this uh, will know my wife kind of wondered how that was going to go. Kim, Kim wanted to know how it was going to go with me actually being your editor since you've been editing me for a half century at every walk of life. So I did, I had a little, I was a little bit nervous, but I enjoyed the opportunity to maybe change a little thing here, change a little there. The only time I'll ever be able to do it, I took it and ran with it. And now that the series is over with, I yield everything back to you. Great. And I hope you'll in, invite me back again to talk about some of the same kinds of things. Oh, absolutely. I think I think I think we might do that. I think it'll be it'll be quite a bit of fun to have you on to talk about the the heels during the season because I know it's such a passion of yours and you do know a lot about the subject. So we'll definitely do that. Any last thoughts? Say thank you. Oh well, thank you and very go much. Heels. <laughs> Shun will like that. That'll be Shun's favorite part of the video right there. All right, for Wilbur Jones, my father, I'm Andrew Jones. You've been watching another UNC podcast here on TarHillIllustrated.com and Tar Heel Illustrated. If you're checking us out on our YouTube channel, if you don't know about our site, head on over there. We got an amazing deal going on right now. Half price, 49 bucks, and you get for one year subscription, and you get $49 worth of Carolina gear for free. So basically, you get us for a year for free and you get gear. So that's a pretty good deal. Thanks for stopping by.